or can we re-decentralize the social networks uh, that we are a part of? Um, and Christine um, uh, Lemmer Weber, she is a Fawcett Fellow, and we have Randy Farmer here as well. Randy um, ha has been maybe still, is maybe still in some of your uh, memories as the person that uh, Chris mentioned, uh, that Chip mentioned when he had this discussion um, on Amex, because uh, Chris and Randy were also uh, involved in Habitat together, which is a project that uh, is still, I think, one of the more uh, um, one of the more exciting um, early early stage. Um, early stage um, virtual worlds um, really that existed and has really pioneered much of the virtual world space that uh, we have today. There's even a really fun project called Neo Habitat. Anyway, I'm totally also going off on a tangent right now, but there's lots, I think, in, in ways in which uh, the presentation um, is really reflecting lots of what people in the um, intelligent corporation uh, group care about. And so now without further ado, I want to welcome Christine and Randy, uh, who will tell you a little bit more about what the Spritely Institute has been up, uh, has been up to lately in terms of how we can get the web and the social uh, systems back that uh, that we once almost had. <laughs> uh, and here uh, we go. Um, and Randy and Christine, the stage is yours. Okay, uh, well, um, it, Allison had asked what my goal was for the year for uh, being a Foresight Fellow, and it was to get this very organization started. And Randy and I are working on that. So I'm gonna hand it to Randy to start um, this presentation. So, um, and then I'll, I'll jump in later. So Randy, go, go ahead. All right, yeah, just put up the first slide. It, sh it should be up. I see the last slide. Oh, oh, yeah, that is the last slide. The slide that's up is let's, re let's redistribute. That, that, is, uh, that is the last slide. Um, so you are getting a spoiler, but now Randy, why don't you jump in in chronological order? All right, yes. go ahead. Um, so uh, we got a great introduction already. We're going to read decentralized network communities. This is an abridged version of our talk. Next slide, please. Um, the outline is as follows. The great areas are going to be compressed. This is out of a big hundred slide. Uh, Randy, it, Randy, yeah. it's, it's really hard to hear you. All right, let me see if I can do something about that. Is this better? Is this better? No? Marginally. Shoot. Zoom does let you boost your microphone input volume in the audio settings. Oh. Usually it sets it automatically. Also nice to see you, if possible. Randy, are you still here? Uh, we may have tried to correct it. For some problem. reason, I muted it. How am I now? Oh, it's very loud. And distorted. Yeah, it's overdriven. Usually, I, the auto setting. Let's give that a try. Is that better? Uh, yeah, down just still a bit. Ver more. Still very blown out, but if you. All right. Hang on. Very sorry about this. I put it on auto and it didn't help. So how's this? That's, That's right. much better. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's go again. Uh, so we're going to give a, a, a bridge version of the talk. Um, there's a lot more detail. If you want more, talk to us later. Um, but we're going to start with a description of how the platforms have failed us. Twitter and YouTube uh, use the term communities, and it's fundamentally flawed. Um, and we're gonna talk about what went wrong. So you'll recognize this graph is how we used to draw what we talked about the web being back in the old days. Um, people would run services and they would all interconnect in a very kind of peer centric web. But what happened instead was network communities became centralized, uh, instead creating a graph that looks more like this with some giant hubs with everybody connecting directly to them. Um, that scale is expensive and needs to be paid for. So bulk of them use engagement-based advertising uh, as their revenue model, but this turns out to create toxic community design. Uh, and you don't even have to take our word for it. Uh, from a post uh, about the Blue Sky Initiative, uh, Jack posted that uh, social media incentives spark controversy and outrage rather than healthy uh, conversation. In short, controversy drives engagement, which drives profit. This is the central uh, centralization engagement trap. 
Uh, those of us who worked in social media know that we worked on reducing friction. That was the goal. Remove all barriers to posting. These hubs, um, turns out this is a never was a safe idea. Why may you ask? Well, good news is they've succeeded. They removed all barriers to sharing and made bad behavior zero cost to the creator. Wait a minute. They've made it negative cost. In other words, it's profitable. Centralization has corrupted our network communities in several ways. First is loss of privacy on the network. Second is the idea of context collapse. Instead of living in a variety of different situations and circumstances, your online life is collapsed into a, a strange una identity. This creates all sorts of problems. And thirdly, we have toxicity and censorship. But really, these are two sides of the same coin. One side is the bad behavior. And one is the failure to mitigate bad behavior. Fundamentally, the economics of advertisement base it, um, for all of this can often it creates surveillance capitalism and is fundamentally socially harmful to the psychological well-being of its participants and bad for society at large and our democratic institutions. When Everyone is connected to everyone else. There's no shared frame of reference. This is known as context collapse. When all the people from all your different walks of life or contexts like work, family, and hobbies are all mixed together in one place, it creates an avoidable information leaks, unavoidable information leaks, sorry, sometimes with serious real world consequences such as group ostracism and even job loss. One colleague called their Facebook feed the worst of Thanksgiving day every day of the year. Because there's no shared context, no common understanding of community norms, there's no way to moderate content without crushing otherwise desirable expression. This destroys communities. They need ways to enforce contextual rules amongst themselves and not depend on some decontextualized AI to decide what's safe to share. I'd like to do a couple of examples of problems. Uh, this has led to the destruction of tens of millions of network communities and their cultural artifacts. In 2013, Google reported that Google Plus had 540 million active users. I was active in several of their communities, but in 2019, they shut every single one of them off. This demonstrates another flaw in the centralized community platform model, complete and utter erasure of high quality, strongly contextual content and the destruction of relationships between the members. In the case of Google+, Plus, there are at least two privacy-related bugs that Google didn't feel like fixing. And this was their excuse for getting rid of a large amount of user content they couldn't adequately moderate or monetize. Next, Yahoo Groups reported 115 million members and more than 10 million groups in 2010. This is more than 12 years ago. And again, a shutdown, first destroying all uploaded community content and then removing web access, making the groups unusable. Groups users became a kind of digital diaspora and many groups never successfully reformed and the members spread out across various other platforms. Yahoo groups shut down because they couldn't figure out the insoluble content moderation problem, or at least it wasn't gonna be profitable to do so. So why you might think, why didn't machine learning do the heavy lifting and moderation? Why can't it? They're trying and there's some things it is doing, but it's not a magic bullet. This is an example of an ML toxicity score from a Google project called Perspectives AI back when they had an online tester. Uh, and it was trained using hand scored postings from Wikipedia talk pages. Here you see it scores, I am a gay black woman is 87% toxic. I worked at Google during this time and worked with the researchers on this problem. It was yet another problem with context. You see, you can't really tell if a single string of text is specifically toxic without understanding the context. For example, one piece of context they were missing, it was a message thread context. Replying, I agree, can be very toxic depending upon what you're replying to. Here's another example. Intel has a project known as Bleep, in which you can set a local AI audio filter to control how much racism and misogyny you want to hear from your Discord audio sessions. This is totally bizarre. False positives damage your experience and not hearing a problem word also provides no means for the community to take corrective or punitive action. Again, Jack Dorsey agreed that centralized enforcement is unlikely to scale and that it places too much burden on the people. 
In short, centralized moderation, community moderation cannot work. Centralization is a pathogen. When the problems come up again and again with these systems, the response is to interpret the centralization as a disease, like a rapidly spreading virus. Thus, the regulatory responses we're seeing can be perceived as a kind of immune response, an attempt to limit damage through regulatory controls. Uh, the EU Digital Services Act proposed a proposal mentions the word gatekeeper over 100 times in 328 pages. That's an assumption that gatekeepers are the default social internet architecture. There's even been an interesting attitude shift from the centralization giants. They are now calling for increased regulation because they know they are the only ones who could ever hope to comply. This is lock in and the monopolists out of the winners and it would lock out all new smaller providers indefinitely. This has happened before, for example, think of the first hundred years of AT&T. Does this seem hopeless? We don't think so. We need to get back to our roots, building on the local community structures we've understood for a millennia. We need to re-decentralize network communities and we're gonna describe how to do that. History provides alternatives. We're gonna, I'm compressing out a section here of the bios for Christine and myself, but this work goes back more than 40 years. I've been working on online community platforms. The one most many of you have heard of, and quite a few people are actually in this meeting today, actually worked at was the Electric Communities Serverless Platform uh, at the, in the early 2000s. Um, we learned a lot from that. And we're gonna talk about that a bit, but that project uh, eventually shut down. Uh, I'm proud to announce we're in the final stages of getting the letter to approve to open source all that work. So those who are interested in it, uh, that's coming. Um, after that in, is the work of Christine. Uh, she's a co-author of the Activity Pub standard, which is the largest currently implemented and successfully deployed open community standards on the internet. But what's interesting is what it doesn't do. Um, it doesn't solve all the problems. It's turning out, letting a bunch of people tilt up their own YouTubes and their own Twitters and their uh, own Facebook-like things doesn't actually solve the problem. We're gonna talk about why. Uh, and that led her into research for the Sprightly project, which we're now calling, we're rolling into the Sprightly Institute. Uh, we'll talk more about that work a little bit, but specifically in researching that work, that's how we got connected. Uh, she featured my face in a presentation she gave at the Activity Pub conference two years ago. That caused a connection and that's why we're picking this up. Uh, in short though, we're talking about a foundation, a, a nonprofit to build open protocols all the way down the stack. It's all about cooperating mutually suspicious distributed objects. We're gonna break into that a little bit. So on top of a, uh, of a layer, we add a layer to the internet of uh, suspicious mutually cooperative objects. We add uh, people objects, which are standard objects to manage people's identity and connections, community posts and governance, and general support for applications of all kinds. There's no centralized gatekeeper for any of these core objects, but individuals will be free to decide to delegate authority to various services, such as many people logging with Facebook. Capabilities are the mechanism we will use to provide mechanisms of consent. They are intentional, limited, granted, accountable, and revocable. So in short, the future won't be distributed Twitter or Facebook or YouTube because it's not enough. What we're talking about is new semantic foundation for the building of the future web. I'm gonna hand over to Christine. All right, so what follows, this is an aspirational sketch of a planned functional future demonstration of the platform, but we actually have a lot of the layers uh, at their core position put together. And much of what you see here has been previously implemented or bench tested previously, but this is the first time we're pulling it all together into one story. Um, so here we see two manifestations of uh, this thing we call an agency. So agency represents you. It is a peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, um, uh, agent that actually uh, there's no gatekeeper involved. Um, and here we see the idea of the agency actually um, in two different 
concepts. So on one side, we see um, kind of an application embedded in a browser window with multiple contexts there. And also on the right-hand side, we see the mobile application that displays context one at a time. Now, the reason we're showing both of these, these is that a lot of our what we're emphasizing here is that context is key. And in the following mockups, we're going to focus on a single context at a time view, which is akin to the mobile application. But what's key is to understand that your agency, the peer-to-peer -peer application that represents you in here, uh, manages multiple contexts for you, much like uh, in the picture on the left is managing multiple windows within the browser application. So let's introduce our friend Alicia. Alicia is a high school math teacher. She plays tabletop games with her friends, and she's an author of fan fiction. And Alicia behaves differently in each one of these contexts. And yet, we do not consider her to be duplicitous for doing so. Alicia has multiple personas she manages through her agency, naturally supporting her as a multifaceted person she is. So here we see Alicia in her math teacher persona. She's in the school application within the subcontext of the trigonometry class she teaches. But the work day is over, so it's time to relax and hang out with her friends. And so she clicks on her persona avatar and is presented with the ability to choose between her different personas. Here we see Ms. A. Nim, Alicia's professional math teacher persona, A. Starlight, her gaming persona, and A. Pen, her fan fiction persona. On the right, we can see what this means from a structural slash system perspective. Alicia exists as a person outside the system, but through using her agency, she is able to use and act as each of her different personas. It's important to remember, of course, that not everyone might know all of Alicia's personas. Her students might only know her as Ms. a -Nim. most of her gaming friends might only know her as a Starlight, and only a few small friends might know her as being a Pen, with most of her fan fiction enthusiasts not knowing of any other identity overlap. So having selected her a Starlight gaming persona, Alicia is now using the chat app in the gaming chat room subcontext her friend set up, Ben's Gaming Hangout. Now note there are no global names in the system. So the names in the solid boxes are contacts which Alicia has in her contact list, not unlike how you might have names specific for you to phone numbers in your phone contact list. And names preceded by a question mark and wrapped in dashed lines are unknown users represented by their own self-proposed names. As we can see, Ben, who Alicia does know, is inviting Alicia over to his friend Carol's place, who Alicia does not yet have a relationship with, to play board games and eat pizza. Alicia expresses interest in attending, so she clicks on Carol's avatar, which brings her to the Carol subcontext of the profile app. Various bits of information about Carol are displayed, and hopefully Alicia sees and clicks on the instant message button. But remember that Alicia and Carol have not yet established a relationship, so how can this be safely done without risking spam in this system? Now, the way is, Carol has configured two paths to establishing a connection one by social invitation, and one by direct payment to Carol. Since Alicia knows Ben who knows Carol, Alicia could choose to ask Ben for an introduction to speak to Carol. But Carol would know that Ben was responsible for the introduction. And if Ben makes a poor choice, Carol can hold Ben accountable. Alternatively, Alicia could directly pay Carol two stamps. Design details for stamps in a future presentation. So once Alicia and Carol have established a relationship, Alicia will have a capability that she can use with no further requirements. However, the use of that capability will be attributed to her. Furthermore, remember how we said that consent is provocable and we are building a capability system modeling consent characteristics. What you'll notice is that Carol has access to a button she can press, which points at the filament in this metaphorical fuse. Well, if Carol presses that button, it will destroy the filament in that fuse. In other words, Alicia can still hold on to this capability, but it's effectively useless. Its messages won't pass through. Well, that's just to demonstrate this. For the time being, Alicia hasn't revoked, uh, uh, Carol hasn't revoked Alicia's access. And so Alicia is now able to have a private discussion with Carol in the chat app. Alicia asks for Carol's address so she can come over to hang out and Carol happily obliges. Carol mentions that, by the way, she just ordered pizza. Would Alicia mind paying her back? And Alicia is, of course, happy to do it. So she clicks on Carol's avatar and back on Carol's page, Alicia clicks on the payment button and authorizes her wallet to pay Carol five bucks. Easy peasy. And so a fun time was had by all with pizza and board games and so on. And on the next day, Alicia and Ben are having a chat when Ben mentions this game called Sushimon that Alicia has never heard of before. Well, Alicia clicks to install Sushimon on her computer. Wait, what? Isn't installing an application straight from a chat room link clowner to everything we've been taught about good security? What if Sushimon wanted to steal all of Alicia's financial documents? 
Well, the good news is, unlike in other systems, installing Sushimon is safe. Sushimon does not run as Alicia. It cannot automatically do all the things Alicia can do. Instead, Sushimon is given access to a restricted part of the file system just for Sushimon, so it can't access Alicia's financial information. Alicia's financial application similarly has access to its own files, but not Sushimon's. This means that if, even if Alicia has shared her financial application access with her accountant, her accountant won't know that Sushi, Alicia likes to play Sushimon. And now that Alicia has Sushimon installed, Ben offers Alicia a starter deck. So Sushimon is able to collaborate with the chat program so that Sushimon can embed a convenient app widget for this operation. However, the widget factory that Sushimon gets access to ensures that any widgets from Sushimon that Sushimon will make are clearly identified as coming from Sushimon, preventing programs from masquerading as one another. So Alicia can click on the widget and select the claim dra action directly, causing the transfer of the deck to her game inventory. Now note, this is full app within an app functionality, but done securely too. And Sushimon's widget can update its presentation accordingly. Now Alicia and Ben can enter the Sushimon app and battle, may the best trader win. Now note that Sushimon is able to take advantage of the contact system to correctly render A Starlight and Ben's names. Also note, this game artwork was designed by Randy's then 13-year-old daughter about 20 years ago for a playable proof-of-concept secure web app. So having had fun battling, Alicia amuses that she'd like to get more cards for next time, and so she buys some from the Sushimon store. Alicia and Ben discuss their cards. Hmm, turns out they both have a card the other one wants. Well, that means it's time to trade. And of course, trading is no problem. Sushimon once again is able to clearly show that Ben and A Starlight are the ones trading with one another. And that's it. That's the end of this uh, mock demonstration. I'm going to hand it over to Randy to remind us what this just did, showed to all of us. So yeah, let's take a quick review of what the agency did for Alicia. It managed her contacts and personas. Um, it provided mechanisms for consent that were revocable uh, for granting access for communications and for sending money. Um, it provided uh, an interface for decentralized naming so that um, no global names were necessary to communicate with the people we wanted to interact with. Um, it provided robust systems for commerce and trade, uh, even without a centralized service to provide that. And likewise, and probably most exciting to me is that we have safe cooperative apps. So let's talk about how we add smart objects on top of the web. This is a quick sketch of the approach. More detailed technical deck is under development. So this is new infrastructure for the internet. It requires a lot of work. That's dedicated research, robust implementation, and significant standards making activity. We're gonna do a layer cake here. It is not comprehensive. It's meant to be an overview of the proposed structure. At the core is a strict support for distributed objects that communicate exclusively through granted capabilities. It has trust frameworks provided to assist making good, but still revocable decisions about core services, such as safe persistence and connection management. The people-related objects are built on top of this, expressing identities and profiles while managing how they share information, connect to one another, and filter what they receive. Once you have people and connections, you can build communities. This layer includes membership, governance, moderation models, and community-specific structures, such as threads and posts. With all of these in place, the top layer adds objects for enabling applications and services such as support, discovery, distributed storage, DeFi, and many others. All open source, all free forever. A uh, quick review, why do we think it should be a nonprofit? Well, because we funded uh, electric communities. Our first attempt was a, a startup. And we were unable to reconcile the need for quarterly engagement growth with the goals of distributed objects on the web. But we did prove the technical foundations are sound. The first section of this presentation showed that the profits focus lead, that it leads to the very mess we're trying to solve. The governance that leads this effort must put the needs of the people first, not pretend that profit is a proxy for good. So it seems likely there are many potential opportunities for revenue, but having that as the primary focus has created toxic results. Even other CEOs believe the future will be increasingly shifting to private encrypted services, and that this is the future they say they want to bring about. Thanks, Zuck. 
But building this right is going to take a lot of work, and that's why we need your help. The good news is we know how to do it, and I've even built the basic foundations of the system. Everything you see here, we have minimal implementation parts in Sprightly. We know how to do it. These are the core layers to be able to make some of this stuff happen. But building software that everyone can use every day is another matter. That's a lot of effort that requires dedicated time, energy, and resources. And so uh, we've got a quote here from Danny O'Brien. Um, Until now, alternatives to existing social networks could only show that they, uh, they could replicate what the tech giants have built. Sprightly shows that with a strong foundation and established security principles, we can build something better, more permanent, that profits its users, not its gatekeepers. Uh, that's uh, from Danny O'Brien, Falcon Foundation for the Decentralized Web, who are, um, uh, who are core people who are helping us uh, start this organization. Um, and uh, Danny has another quote. Um, Danny mentioned, so we're excited about Sprightly because it helps um, give decentralized networks the opportunity to make good on the promises that legacy social media made and then broke. Secure, private, and empowering communications between friends for the benefit of all. So um, that's it. Uh, what we really want to get out of this is that we, we what you want you to really realize is that we have an opportunity here to make a new foundation for the internet, one that's healthier for people and for communities. The time and the place for that is now, so we hope we can work together to make that happen. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm really especially happy because we still have three more minutes uh, to ask any questions, um, uh, which I think, I mean, you've only, I think, opened up a, lo uh, um, a lot of buckets here, and I'm hoping that you'll join on Discord afterwards. But one for me is like, what is an, if people are inspired now, what is an immediately actionable Thing that they could do to help like what's an action item here that falls out of it well some stuff was already showing up in the jet uh the chat we're still very early in funding our first lead sponsor is going to be the file coin foundation for the decentralized web um so we're looking for partners both technical and uh sponsor partners uh so who do we need to know about who needs to hear about this who needs to be part of this early um those are all important things. So it's a nonprofit and it's the beginning, you know, it's, it's a little bit of stone soup. We got bring together the people right now. It's Christine and I, and a few allies, uh, who else should we talk to? And, uh, okay. And just one them? more that we have it on the video. How do they best reach out? Uh, that last slide had our email address, uh, contact at sprightly.institute or, um, you can, uh, I'm, should I give our email addresses? I'll risk giving my email address directly and right in here. Yeah, you can sure. email cweber at cwebber at dustycloud.org. Randy, if you want to give yours, you sure. can go ahead. Randy.farmer at pobox.com. Great. We already have um, a few collaboration requests here in the chat, and we have a question from uh, David. Yeah, I was, just, I was just curious if you'd speak more to what level of the stack you imagine Sprightly existing at. Um, for example, is this all a web app? Is this native apps that people are installing? Is this like an operating system level? Well, yeah, so, yeah, so so the agency we're talking about here, uh, and, and we want that to uh, as a we want it to be able to succeed as a web app. Uh, we don't know right now that what's available technically meets all the requirements. It's probably close. Uh, so, so we didn't we left out our our planning slide, but there's a whole, whole track for. Uh, native, you know, native console, native app on browsers or, or, or web app, because getting a native app on to mobile is still a challenge, right? Uh, when you're saying we're going to redefine how social interacts, I bet you the Apple store is not going to be so happy about that. Um, so, can, so specifically can real ramping major teams about those. Go ahead. Um, so uh, the, the, I think also the question is, you know, um, how much infrastructure is required to build this? And, uh, you know, we, we believe that there's, there's a lot that can be reused. The, the Agoric folks uh, have actually done a great job of showing how you can use a lot of stuff in the JavaScript world and take that. And we actually are, we're, we're in close communication with them to make sure our stuff can interact. Uh, but, um, but also, the, there are a lot of pieces here that are not the way that people are used to programming. And it's important to provide those essential infrastructure to be able to make sure that people can program these things naturally. Just the way that people are used to thinking about programming won't result in this infrastructure. We need right. to make it familiar enough 
to the tools that people have while also giving people new tools so that these are the kind of systems that emerge naturally. Yeah, this is one of the reasons we chose Institute over Foundation is a, a, is a very large educational component in teaching programmers to think in capabilities. We or will is, uh, likely uh, be taking on some of that also in, in the next year, yeah. at least in, uh, in bits and pieces. But we had a question from Esteban, who I think is still here. Uh, yes, uh, I was wondering if you are envisioning or how are you envisioning how to share changes to the software, to the view capabilities, or maybe even to the data structures powering uh, these interactions? Uh, with other users or how will uh, version control or software control of those things will look like? I know that it's uh, probably <laughs> a really hard question, but I, I wonder if you've had any cool ideas about that. Yeah, this is known as one of the capabilities great conundrum. This is the update problem. Uh, we are so talking, we have not decided yet. But there, uh, but but when you're talking about things like revision control and stuff like that, we don't need to throw away the ability for people to use de all the developer tools they currently have, right? Stuff right. like you can still develop this stuff on top of Git. You can still do a whole lot of those things. Um, there's, uh, we're we're um, so yeah, we're 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 building uh, um, a new future foundational layer of the internet. That doesn't mean that you need to completely throw away everything you know. We just need to really make it secure. And there's there's a lot of there's a lot of history and thinking that we've been compiling to show how to do that. Yeah, yep. and, and and although we said it twice, at least twice or three times in the presentation, it does take worth mentioning. We're not trying to replace those things. We're just trying to provide an alternative approach to using the internet where people are primitive and communities are primitive objects instead of things under control of large gatekeepers. It's th There will still be gatekeepers. Twitter will still be there, but what you use it for might change. And uh, Meta will still be there but you probably don't want to use groups after this is out. I just want to uh, I want to just interject that the uh, the upgrade problem that Randy mentioned is actually the bridge between the two parts of the session today, which is the thing that makes the upgrade problem hard is exactly the ontological crisis exactly. of old instances being premised on code that has now been changed. That's right. Yep. Uh, it's not trivial, but the greatest minds in the world are working on it. <laughs> Great. We have Wesley. Yeah, the um, uh, that's a great presentation. The um, personas idea is really interesting. I don't, I don't think I've really come across anything quite like that. Um, I'm a little confused. So one, um, in your example, you have. Uh, a uh, teacher persona in a teacher context, and then you have a gaming persona in a gaming context. Is the idea that you might switch between di different personas within one context, or is there always like a like a one to one mapping there? There's uh, a no. there, there's a there's intentional, explicit, consensual linking between components, but you're able to so the the mockup is a mockup, right? So we have we know how a lot of these things work, but you know that's not supposed to be the final user interface. It is supposed to be the case that you can smoothly swim, transition between the different roles, uh, you know, your different your different personas and choose how to be able to bring those together. There's obviously a lot of user interfaces challenges to work on to be able to do that, but one of the key things like the the real key if you really want to take something away from this presentation, it's that Everyone got the idea of context wrong by thinking we're going to solve the world's global problems by creating one unified global context, and we'll figure out all, all the rules for that. What we're really giving here is a way where contacts capture and carry the information that's relevant to them. So if you want to share things between the different contexts of your different personas, you can do that, but it's an intentional act. And uh, if you want to switch between different personas, you can absolutely do that. We're not taking the, we don't believe that the Facebooks um, and Google a few years ago both believed they could stop bad behavior by forcing everyone to use their own real world names right? right and it didn't right you know that that didn't solve the problem so what is the context and how do we build systems that know about are aware of and carry context information with them yeah and and, and so they are not tightly coupled except applications might want them to be tight more tightly coupled and that's an application design constraint uh, and, and you also as a user interface you might want to let someone know if they're 
moving into a context where they have a persona that they normally use and you're, they're going in with the wrong persona. They might say, hey, did you mean to switch? Uh, so that kind of persona context management is a new class of user interface challenge, which is part of what we're anticipating. Uh, and we have it now, but it's called a password manager. It's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. So the 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 there are really two there are really two big uh, um, two big problems. So the object capabilities of space. So as Randy mentioned earlier, I had been working on ActivityPub and the ActivityPub ecosystem, and you know there's still a bridge element that to 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 that world to some degree. But we're talking about a bunch of new things, and people are like, why throw like you know people figured out how to roll out ActivityPub. Why not just be slightly incremental on what we have, right? And Randy and I both believe that that won't work. And you know obviously I have incentives where if that would work, that would be ideal. You know I you know but there are um, there what is interesting. So when ActivityPub fit, when we finished standardization. I was left with a decision of what do I do? And uh, what I felt like I really had the best ability to do was to think about the problems we hadn't solved and try to do research for who and where had solved those problems. That's what led Randy's picture to show up and also me to connect to many people in this community, right? So a number of years ago, I, Mark Miller and I started talking actually because I was directly seeking out these problems. And at a conference I happened to run and I was like, oh, you're, you're a person who knows about a bunch of the things that I'm trying to fix, right? And a lot of these things have been explored historically. The answer is it's not as if they've all are new territory. There are some new territories though. The upgrade problem was mentioned as one of the areas that's kind of the frontier of OCAP stuff. We know a lot of the pieces of how to solve it, but we haven't built everything to make it comfortable yet, I'd say. Um, I, I wonder well, how Mark it, will feel about that. But, and well, but, and this is very much well, one of those things we'll move into standard space and work with the community to figure out the best choices or and what, but, whether or not there's multiple ones. But there's one more piece that's really the frontier, and that's the secure user interface stuff, right? So that some of this stuff has actually happened and has been done previously, but we haven't seen it rolled out in major ways. But one of the things that the OCAP community, and also I believe, is that um, you don't, that the idea that you have to, that there's a false belief in most of the world, which is that you either have things that are really secure, but really annoying and difficult for users, or you have things that are easy to use, but really insecure. And that's not a belief that the OCAP world and I share. Um, it, and that actually is related to capturing context. A secure application has the flow actually walk you and bring you through what the right elements of security yeah. are. But that is one of the frontiers um, we might know a lot of the patterns, but we haven't worked with professional graphic designers and everything like that to make them really shiny, for example. Yeah, Alan Karp, who was in this call, is a pioneer in this area. So we hope to get him as closely involved as possible. <laughs> okay, any other comments, questions that people here in this call have? Alan is on there in case you want to make a comment, but. Um, yeah, we what we found out, uh, we had a situation where we built a prototype, a very simple file sharing tool. And one of our users asked us how to turn on security. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so Mark Stigler and I did this work and uh, it actually took us a month to figure out how we did it. Um, <laughs> but we came up with a set of design principles for, um, and, and the key thing is that uh, you want to be able to unambiguously know the answer to a security question from the user's actions in the UI. And we managed to do it, at least for this simple tool. OK, lovely. Well, we just unpacked uh, a bunch of things. Um, and I shared a few links for context here uh, in the chat in case people want to read up. You know how to reach Christine and, um, and Randy. And you know that there's lots of opportunities to contribute. It's, it's very early on and, and a very exciting project. So congratulations, first of all, for getting it off the ground. Really, really happy that really within the year you, you said it and it's happening. And, and so happy to see Falcon involved. I think it's a really um, very strong signal. I can't wait to see you in person at uh, Vision Weekend. And, and just to you know, dive a little deeper, I think Danny is also coming and a few others too. You just posted again the emails here in the chat. Uh, I'm hoping to see many of you on Discord and you're also on there. So if any people have follow-up questions, then that may be a good venue to move on. Thanks everyone for staying on 10 minutes longer. I thought Thank we you, had two fantastic presentations. And actually, as Mark said, they weren't unrelated, but 
<laughs> one of them is a necessary component to fix or to at least make progress on another one too. So very, very exciting. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your week. And I see many of you in less than two weeks at Vision Weekend in San Francisco. So see you all very soon. And thanks for joining.